Today's EMN5 is going to be on inhalational injuries, mostly in the context of fire, like exposure to a house fire. It's really important to think about the inhalational injuries patients can sustain when exposed to smoke or when in a house fire, when brought in. It could be they have no burns whatsoever, but if they've been exposed to a room with a lot of smoke, they could have some significant injuries. The reason to think about this is because it has a very, very high mortality. About half of all fire-related deaths are actually from the inhalational injuries themselves. There are two risk factors you kind of think of that increase the risk for inhalational injuries. That's closed spaces and altered mental status. These risk factors mean higher concentrations of smoke and longer periods of exposure. So for example, looking at these two pictures, which situation is the person exposed going to have a higher risk of inhalational injury? It would definitely be this one on the left. It's a closed room, um, much higher concentration of smoke. In thinking about the injuries sustained, you want to divide it up into the upper airway and lower airway. Starting with the upper airway, that's where you're going to have the direct thermal burns. That's going to be a lot of fast edema that happens right there in the ER while you're watching them. There can be some particulate and toxin injury as well, but the main thing is the direct thermal burn to the upper airway. In the lower airway, you have more of the particulate and toxin effects. This is very, very irritating to the lower airway and does cause edema, but it's much more delayed within the next 24 hours. There can be some direct thermal burns to the lower airway, but that's more with steam injuries, so a little bit less common in house fires. Now, what is this particulate injury that we're talking about with the lower airway? Well, that's mostly what we call microparticles. You can see in the smoke, there's just tons of debris, and that's caused from an incomplete combustion during the fire. The microparticles are defined as less than 0.5 micro micrometers, so very small. It gets way down into the bronchioles and causes bronchospasm and edema. You can see that really fine white dust all over everything, and you can imagine if that's what's on the outside, just think about what's on the inside of the lungs of these patients. Toxic inhalants are divided into three categories. The first is the tissue asphyxiants. For example, carbon monoxide, hydrogen cyanide, these are things that at a, a chemical cellular level cause hypoxia, so in direct interaction with hemoglobin or at the mitochondrial level. Cyanide is caused from the burning of wool, silk, vinyl, polyurethane, essentially things that are inside houses. So this is a very high risk for patients that are in house fires. Second, you have the pulmonary irritants. That's what we talked about, that partially combusted material, the microparticles. That causes edema in the lower airways, surfactant loss, bronchospasm, and eventually can cause atelectasis as well. This really leads to an ARDS-like picture, maybe a day or two down the line, and can cause a lot of damage. And third, you have the systemic toxins. So we're looking at this patient, we need to make an assessment. And in the ER, that upper airway edema is our major concern. We have to decide, is this someone we're going to intubate or not? Signs to look out for are facial burns, soot in the sputum, perioral burns, if the patient sounds hoarse or is having strider or wheezing, or has any upper airway or oral pharyngeal edema, these are all things to be concerned about and think about early intubation. Another thing to think about in this patient is the burns to the neck. Circumferential burns are also very concerning, and a patient who has altered mental status. If you are able to get a bronchoscope right away, you can see in this airway there is soot right in the bronchus itself. And here's another image post-burn day four. You can see that this is really going to lead to a lot of damage down the line. These are all patients that are concerning and you should be intubating early. There's no definitive method to assessing and deciding if you need to intubate someone. This is all a clinical assessment and all these signs are good things to look for. You can, however, use ABGs, a chest x-ray, which will be more helpful in a delayed fashion. Also, you should make sure to get a carbon monoxide level. And if you have a bronchoscope available, that's a very helpful method to assess the patient's airway directly. In treatment, think about our upper and lower airways. Early intubation for the upper airway for that very rapid edema that you need to be aware of. Lower airways, all patients should receive 100% oxygen. Humidified can be helpful and also bronchodilators to help with the spasm. Make sure you think about the other toxicities the patient may have been exposed to, such as carbon monoxide and cyanide, and monitor the patient in the ER with ABGs, clinical status, and also recheck that carbon monoxide level. So three to remember for inhalational injuries in patients exposed to fire and smoke, these things can kill. Be aware that even if the patient doesn't have bad burns, you need to assess them for an inhalational injury. For upper airway injuries, think direct thermal damage causing immediate edema. Lower airway is more the irritants, which can cause a delayed reaction and ARDS a few days down the line. 
Treatment is going to be 100% oxygen, early intubation, and make sure you use your clinical assessment to decide if this patient is sick or not sick. Thanks again for joining us on EMN5, and hopefully we'll see you next week.